graduated from Stanford, and he was in the inaugural class. If you do further research, you understand that he was the son of the caterer to Leland and Jane Stanford. I, some people may not find this pleasurable or not, but I did have the pleasure of being able with some other alums to buy a headstone for his grave and actually have a ceremony in Sacramento because there was no headstone. And alums felt this was not okay. And so we got together and bought a headstone and had a ceremony in Sacramento. So he's buried in Sacramento. But this shows you sort of this pioneering spirit. This, I'm going to go against what is the norm, clearly, you know, in 1891, to be a part of the Stanford, the Stanford academic environment, but an opportunity was given to him to actually be here. So we felt what better fit than to call this program the Ernest Houston Johnson Scholars Program. You, in a certain way, are also either adding to your educational journey for your family or starting it. And that's what you will also be able to talk to about tonight and hear when Professor Allison Hobbs speaks. So I do have a few housekeeping notes I'd like for Doc to come forward so we can really share with you what the structure of Johnson Scholars is going to be so you can also share this with some of your friends that wanted to join but they were unsure. Hi, right, good evening, everybody. My name is Wagner Oswald. I'm also known as Doc. I am the man who's been sending you all of many emails, so thank you for indulging me, putting up with me, everything like that. How was the first day of class? Good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I hope this is a nice culmination to your first day of class. When you look back on this day in 2016, you remember, you know, this is how you ended that very first day. Uh, I'm going to go with you, through with you on your um, syllabus right quick. We're going to do some course logistics things before we get started with uh, the lecture. And then afterward, we'll still address some questions that you might have uh, as they come up. So um, just beginning, I'll briefly read the, the, the course description. Welcome to the Ernest Houston Johnson Scholars Program 2016 cohort. This two-quarter program is designed to help you maximize your Stanford career by critically and intentionally thinking about what you want out of your college experience. In the fall quarter, you'll be asked to design your Stanford life, and we'll push you to discover your identity and role at Stanford and beyond. All the while, you'll be exposed to the excellence and opportunities of older students, of Stanford alumni, of Stanford faculty, and we'll be helping you to build a sense of community, a sense of belonging within this 2016 cohort. We'll also give you some good tips and introducing you to great people to start to know your professional and academic networks. This is a one unit credit or credit course, so, you know, it's pretty good bang for your uh, credit bucks right now, I'm going to say. Um, so just to let you know why it's such a good bang for your buck, you were only meeting four times this entire quarter. So tonight is our first time. The second time we'll be meeting, um, and as you'll see, the, the way that the class meeting schedule is laid out, we have the actual meeting and the time it's happening, its location, and then we'll have uh, the kind of objectives, the goals of what we're getting out of each meeting. So the next thing is going to be our retreat. It's October the 12th, which is a Friday. We're going to leave at 4 o'clock p.m. How many people know that they have Friday classes already, like Friday afternoon classes that you know you'll get out at 3:50. You need to like rush over here. Okay, cool. What time do you get out? Or are they after? It ends at, what time is it? I think it ends at 4. Okay, well then in that case we might do some like leaving at 4 30 so we can make sure we get everybody. But uh, it is Friday evening we're going to leave. We're going off campus. You'll find out where we're going when we get there. Uh, <laughs> you'll be alive. Don't worry about that. Uh, um, and then we're coming back Saturday night. So a little over 24 hours. Uh, but we're hoping that that's going to be pretty uh, impactful and influential on you, especially in terms of thinking about your Stanford career and setting concrete, specific goals for yourselves. Um, on November 11th, we're going to have uh, our third meeting. It's a nighttime meeting. Um, it's at late night, so that's another free food type of jump off. Um, and you're going to be, it's an opportunities panel, so we're going to talk about research, going abroad, all those different things. Um, and then lastly, we're going to have a mentor meeting for our last meeting for this quarter. So this is really kind of looking ahead to the winter quarter, which is when you're going to be paired with a graduate student, two undergraduate mentors, and then some people within your own class uh, who are in the program. So like say, you know, people who are at Sydney, 
we're going to be with the Sydney grad student, or people who are like history uh, majors will be with like, you know, history students. And we're going to try to help you in that. We're going to get a little bit more narrow and focused in for the winter quarter. Um, and again, that one, another one you need, it'll be, you know, some good bang for your credit bucks. So all of our contact information is listed after the class meeting. We've got Jan's information there, uh, as well as some instructional staff, so myself, um, DeAndre Thompson, who's the Associate Director of the Black Community Services Center in the back. And then our two um, student staff coordinators. Uh, you guys want to say your names and where you're from right quick? Um, I'm Crystal, I'm a sophomore, and I'm from New York City. Uh, Phil, I'm a junior, and I'm from San Antonio, Texas. So they're going to be doing a lot, especially in terms of recruiting your specific graduate and undergraduate mentors, helping us put those things together, and just making sure that everybody loves everybody. Um, so lastly, a um, very important thing about course grade and how this one credit is going. We fully anticipate that everybody is going to get one credit, and this is simply how you do it. Just come to all four of the meetings, basically. Um, there will be reflection assignments after each meeting, or and they're all leading up to each other. Everything is connected, believe me. The whole idea of this is that everything is done with purpose and intention, so everything is for a reason, even if you feel like, what the heck am I doing right now? Um, so I'll, give, I'll read this so that there's no confusion about it. This is a one unit credit, no credit course. Credit will be based on participation and completion of assignments. All students are, are expected to participate in every event class meeting in order to receive credit. Makeups are only allowed for the first lecture, which can be watched online via coursework after we're done today. All assignments, which are reflections based on prompts, will be posted to coursework, and they'll need to be turned in on the assignment date. And as you see, we have such large periods of time in between. So we're going to have large periods of time in between them to do this, too. And what that means, we'll talk about this a little bit later tonight. Um, but just what it means is, is to give you an opportunity to put as much time and thought into that project as you deem necessary. Um, so anyway, those are some housekeeping course logistics. Uh, we're looking forward to a thoughtful, productive quarter. And we've got one last minute we'll bring out. OK. OK. So <clears throat> when you all join, you can go ahead and come up out. Oh. How many of you all want to be exposed to fellowships, internships, and scholarships? OK. How many of you all want a chance to have an intimate dinner, not like hundred of us listening to one faculty, but an intimate dinner with world-renowned faculty. Okay? How many of you all want to meet high power alumni? How many of you have some type of migration or immigration 
um, probably not in, in generations not too far past our own. Um, and I certainly ask you to feel free to interrupt me and ask any questions that you have. And Jan also wanted me to talk a little bit about my experience in college, um, which I'm happy to talk about as well. Um, but I'll just start by talking a little bit about the migration, um, and we're going to kind of, it's going to be interactive, so we'll get, get your thoughts and your comments on some of the materials that I show as well. Okay. So I'm going to start with our slide here. Okay, great. So the Great Migration is really a major watershed in African American history and in American history. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Isabel Wilkerson, who is the author of a phenomenal new work on the Great Migration, writes that the migration is probably the biggest underrepresented story of the 20th century. Over the course of six decades, six million black southerners left the South in search of new lives. An estimated half million left in the short five-year span between 1916 and 1921. Over time, this mass relocation would dwarf the California gold rush and would far outnumber the Dust Bowl migration and also would really be much larger than any other migration of, in American history. So it's, a, it's an enormous migration, an enormous period of change in American history. Nearly every black family in America weighed the decision of whether to stay or to go. It was a topic that was discussed everywhere, in people's homes, in churches, and on street corners. By the time the migration was over in the 1970s, few Americans had not been touched by it. The children and grandchildren of those who decided to leave the South were raised in a world that their ancestors could not have imagined. This was a mass movement, and it was a leaderless movement. In fact, ministers who urged their flocks not to leave the South would soon find themselves trailing behind their congregants who had already taken the lead and headed north. In some cases, entire churches were reconstituted in northern cities. So tonight we're going to discuss the contours uh, and some of the major moments of the migration. And we're going to explore the meanings of the Great Migration from the perspectives of the migrants themselves, focusing mainly on their decisions to leave the South and on their adjustment to life in northern cities. It's important for us to first situate the Great Migration within the larger history of the Black freedom struggle and to recognize that the Great Migration is a crucial moment in the ongoing fight against Jim Crow segregation. This was the first mass act of independence by African Americans since emancipation. And it's important for us to keep in mind the effects that the migration would have on American political and urban history. The massive political realignments of the 20th century the movement of blacks out of the Republican Party and into the Democratic Party, which would be crucial in the presidential elections of FDR and President Truman, would not have been possible without the Great Migration. The migration's imprint is everywhere in urban life. The configuration of cities, the social geography of black and white neighborhoods, the spread of housing projects, the rise of a black middle class, white flight, and suburbanization, each of these phenomena grew out of the Great Migration. And all of the major landmark political developments of the 20th century, the New Deal, industrial unionism, the Great Society, and of course the Civil Rights Movement, would be difficult, if not impossible to imagine, without this massive demographic shift. The migration also had a profound cultural impact on American society. The migration would influence the food, the language, the dance, and the dress that we take for granted. People around the world have been enriched 
by the music that the migrants carried north with them. The migration transformed American music and nationalized and popularized American music. So three of the most influential figures in jazz, Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane, and Miles Davis were all children of the migration. So since the migration had such a profound effect on American culture, I thought we could start with some music. Um, so I'm going to play a song for you that was recorded by a woman named Memphis Minnie in 1934. And you guys have the lyrics, so I'm expecting everyone to sing along. <laughs> So this is a song called Chickasaw Train Blues. Memphis Minnie was born in Algiers, Louisiana, and she was one of the most influential and pioneering female blues musicians and guitarists of all time. She was known for being very flamboyant and wearing bracelets made of silver dollars. And she was a migrant herself, traveling first to Memphis, Tennessee, um, and then on to Chicago in the 1930s. And hey, what state did you say she was from? She's from Louisiana. So here's here's the Chickasaw Train Blues by Memphis. <laughs> Right, that 
did often happen that men would often go ahead of their families and find a job, find a place to live, and then their families would follow. Right? Yeah, what else? What else does she say? What, what's the image that you, that you get from this song? What is the Chickasaw? Yeah. It was like a missing, leaving off of the train going away and it's never just Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you get the sense of, of the migration going in one direction, basically. It's everyone's leaving the south and going to the north. Yes. And it seems as though she feels betrayed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. She feels sort of left behind. <coughs> the Chickasaw is taking all the men and she's alone. Right. Yeah. Did I see a hand? Yes, yeah. So I was wondering, in this great migration, I'm not really that familiar with it. Was it just like the men traveled, or was it like it's a great set families and split up, or was it our families so? That's a great question, and we're going to talk about that more. It, it happened in many different ways. So in some cases, men did go before women, um, and then the families did sort of come afterwards. In some cases, the whole family went all together at the same time. Um, and then what's interesting about Memphis Minnie, Minnie singing this song is that blues women were often migrants themselves, and as, as she was. So many of the, the blues women, like Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith, um, they actually often left their homes in the South and traveled to perform. So even though she's singing this from the perspective of a woman who has been left behind, she herself traveled all the time. Um, so, so, so it also depended on you know, what your profession was and you know, what access you had to, to travel as well. Yeah. Anything else about Memphis Mini before we move on? OK, well, keep, keep this in mind. And now we're going to look at two poems um, by two migrants, one by Langston Hughes, the novelist, and playwright who would live in Missouri, Kansas, Washington, D.C., and Cleveland before making Harlem his home, and one by Richard Bright, who was born in Mississippi and moved to Chicago in 1927 and became a permanent expatriate in Paris in 1946. <laughs> so can I ask for two volunteers to read these two poems? We'll start with Richard Bright's poem. Yeah, whereas I feel like that kind of uh, 
kind of going up sort of two key areas, right? It was kind of like the two forms that if you have opportunities on the community, you can have the issues that you don't have to talk about rather than thinking about those first. Right, exactly. Great, right. yeah, thank you. Yes. So we had kind of like exemplified like the difference maybe between the um, experiences of men and women mm -hmm. in the South. Because like the um, name lady, yeah. she was so like, this, like she didn't want to leave and she was so resentful of the fact of the migration in comparison to like what she's talking about, like men, it seemed like they were more, they felt more oppressed and so they were more willing to leave than they were Right, right, yeah. Yeah, you do get this sense that you know they're both hoping, they're both hopeful um, that this that the North will offer a new life for them and new possibilities for them as men, in a sense that they'll be able to you know be away from these people who lynch and run to be away from that kind of fear. Yes, I felt like for me, especially like after hearing this, it was more of like the disdain for the women who were there from which is that I felt that sort of thing. So that's yeah. like the flip side. Right, yeah, yeah. So in Memphis Minis, in the Chickasaw song, you don't necessarily get a sense of where she's from specifically, you just get a sense that people are leaving. Whereas this, Langston Hughes is being very specific about where he wants to go, you know, and where he wants to go. Right, yeah, exactly, right, yeah. Was there a hand on the side? Yes. Um, I was just, I just thought it was interesting that we got three different parts of the spectrum with these two pieces. So for instance, this piece was more like, um, you got a sense that the leaving was a bad thing. Right. Whereas the first poem, it was like, maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, and I, I'm not sure yet, and this was like, definitely a good thing. So I just thought That's that was great. interesting that there was, there was more than one, um, more than a dichotomy. Exactly. how people feel about this. Exactly. Thing. That's that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that's sort of what we're going to get at today is exploring these multiple perspectives on the migration um, and exploring how it affected different lives, different individual lives. And you guys have done a great job of already pointing out the ways that it might make a difference, whether you were a man or a woman. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about class differences and how that affected the, the migration. Um, but again, we're going to try to do it all through the voices of the migrants themselves. So history really provides us no easy answers, um, and, and that's exactly what you're getting at, that you know there are these multiple perspectives. Um, but I hope that by listening to the experiences and the stories of migrants in their own, own words, um, we can come to a better understanding of the migration and whether it did meet their expectations. So we can sort of think about, you know, did, did, did this sort of north that's kind of painted as you know, a place where they could enjoy freedom and enjoy the good life, did that actually come true for the migrants once they arrived? Okay, so I just want to start with a little bit of historical context about the migration. Um, so first, um, this here's a map of the Black Belt. And at the beginning, you see these, the, the southern states um, in the, the slide to your right. Um, so this gives you a sense of sharecropping and the kind of rural experience of most blacks during the period before the migration. The map shows you the density of um, farms that were sharecropped. And as, as you probably know, that the sharecropping was a very kind of abusive form of labor that many black farmers um, had to engage in where they did not own the land that they lived on, but rather they worked the land um, but they, they never really received fair wages for, for their work. So this was also another reason why many decided to move to the North in the hope of, of actually getting fair wages for, for their labor. So at the beginning of the 20th century, the center of black life remained firmly located in the farms and plantations of the South. Most African Americans worked on the tobacco farms of Virginia, the rice plantations of South Carolina, the cotton fields in East Texas and sorry, Mississippi, and in the villages and backwoods of other southern states. Even as late as 1930, the black population was still overwhelmingly southern, with 78% of African Americans living in the South. And this map, again, gives us a sense of kind of the density of that population. But by the 1970s, everything would change. 
A peasantry would become a proletariat as Southern migrants became the backbone of the first African-American working class. For the first time in the nation's history, meaningful employment outside of the South beckoned large numbers of African-Americans and encouraged by labor recruiters, railroad companies, and black newspapers, family members and friends who had already moved and facing a climate of racial repression at home, thousands responded with their feet. And this is actually a monument to the migrants that's in Chicago. Um, so this, this is a, it's, it's meant to sort of capture the thousands of migrants who hope to find a better life in Chicago. Oriented towards the north, the migrant waves to his new home, while his other hand carries a worn suitcase. The man is depicted wearing a suit made of shoe soles, and he is rising out of a mound of shoe soles. So the soles are worn and full of holes to symbolize the difficulty that the migrants <laughs> faced on their journeys north. So just again, to, to kind of give a little bit of historical context, the migration grew out of the broken promises of the post-Civil War, post-emancipation, Reconstruction era, which officially ended in 1877. Northward migration was already underway in the 1880s when some black elites left the South. These earlier northward migrations were known as the migration of the Talented Tenth. By the 1880s, growing numbers of blacks began to take the first step in a series of smaller migrations by moving from rural areas first to southern towns and then to northern cities. So there were movements to western states during the 1870s and 1880s. African Americans who participated in these movements were known as exodusters. Is anyone here from Kansas or Oklahoma or you are, okay. So were, were, was your family involved in this movement? Um, do you know? Uh, I would say okay, okay, that's, that's great. Well, it's very interesting because this was an early migration. Um, and in Oklahoma, some African Americans created all black towns, which you can see in that slide. Um, and the exodusters mostly came from Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, and Tennessee. 650 residents of Memphis settled in Oklahoma in the aftermath of the lynching of black grocery store owners, Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Henry Stewart. And here's a picture of the uh, anti-lynching activist Ida B. Wells who is with the, uh, the wife, the widow, and the two children of Thomas Moss. And Moss's last words were haunting and struck an immediate chord with black southerners. He said, tell my people to go west. There is no justice for them here. So racial violence was one of the major factors that catalyzed the migration. Grizzly lynchings, the grotesque mutilation of black men and women, the burning alive of human beings, became a form of leisure for some southern white spectators and prompted many blacks to seek physical safety in the north. Between 1882 and 1930, approximately 3,220 blacks were victims of lynching. This meant that between the years 1890 and 1917, two to three black southerners were murdered each week. And of course, these are only the recorded lynchings. So these statistics do not tell the entire story. <laughs> so this is an image of a, a kind of crowd of people that have gathered to watch a lynching. And you can see that a parent is sort of hoisting a child on their shoulders so that they can watch the lynching themselves. And that was, that was 
very common, where lynchings became sort of a, a, a form of leisure or recreation. People would have a picnic or they'd have a barbecue and children were, were there to, to see this occur. Um, so this is titled Her First Lynching. Um, this is a postcard, and this was another thing that was quite common, where someone would, uh, who had attended a lynching would then send a postcard back uh, to family members to say that they had gone to the, they had gone to a lynching and maybe they would say you know they would send a picture of of where they where they stood to watch the lynching or they would send a picture of where the person had been lynched um, so this says this was made in the courtyard in Center Texas um, he is a 16 year old black boy he killed Earl's grandmother she was Florence's mother give my best from Aunt Myrtle. Um, so this was this was a common way that people would sort of spread the news about a lynching. Um, and then here we have a newspaper article about a man who was lynched in Georgia. And this was also very common. It says, hang by unknown parties. Um, so there was often that kind of language that, you know, we don't know who did it, this sort of secrecy that, that white Southerners would keep, you know, um, even when it was very well known who had committed the lynching, um, everyone would sort of keep quiet about it and you know, it was often, often came up in the newspaper as unknown parties. Um, so there was also a state of race riots. Um, the epidemic of lynching coupled with race riots in Wilmington in 1898, and here you have some images of the Wilmington race riot, um, and then there were reports that the sidewalks of Atlanta ran red with blood of dying and dead blacks after a race riot occurred in 1906. Um, these events underscored the efforts of white rioters to expel African Americans from their cities. And historians have summarized the reasons for migrating as push and pull factors. Push factors being the factors that pushed migrants out of the South, and then pull factors being the factors that pulled migrants to the North. So of course, racial violence was a push factor. The collapse of the cotton economy due to an infestation of a pest called the wool weevil created another push factor. And other pull factors included decreased European immigration, um, during World War I, so the outbreak of World War I in August of 1914 spurred a dramatic demographic shift and decreased foreign immigration led to heightened demand for workers in American cities like Chicago, Detroit, and New York. The war created a severe labor shortage in the industrial north as European immigrants who had stoked American industrial expansion for almost a century could no longer cross the wartime Atlantic Ocean. Labor agents also transmitted information about new employment opportunities and assisted migrants. And labor agents became convenient scapegoats for white Southerners who preferred not to confront the real reasons underlying migration. So here you have sort of a caricature of a labor agent as um, you know a kind of shifty guy who was trying to get um, African Americans to move to the north. Um, so another major pull factor, push and pull factor actually, was um, World War One, and African Americans' experiences in World War One served as an important push factor. President Woodrow Wilson's call for Americans to go to war to make the world safe for democracy gave African Americans the language and the leverage they needed to voice issues of inclusion and racial justice into the public conversation. Wilson, the first Southern Democrat to win a presidential election since 1848, directed his lofty sentiments toward Europeans, but African Americans could ground them in domestic soil and in their own battles for citizenship. In 1915, W.E.B. Du Bois urged African Americans to close ranks, the title of his famous editorial published in 1915. He argued that African Americans should enlist, believing that military service 
was one way that African Americans could gain citizenship rights. Can I have a volunteer who would be willing to read Du Bois's editorial? Who'd like to read this? Yes, please, thank you. We of the colored race have no ordinary interest in the outcome. <laughs> that which the German power represents today spells death to the aspirations of Negroes and all darker races for equality, freedom, and democracy. Let us not hesitate. Let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances and close our ranks shoulder to shoulder without our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it gladly and willingly without eyes lifted to the hills. Great, thank you, thank you. So World War I brought almost 400,000 African Americans into the military and sent 200,000 of these men to Europe as part of the American Expeditionary Forces. And here's a picture of the Harlem Hellfighters, um, which was the 369th Infantry. This was the, all, the first all-black regiment to serve in World War I. The Great War gave many black people their first taste of life outside of the confines of the American racial system. France came to represent emotionally and figuratively all that the United States denied African Americans. African Americans held fast to the belief that France was somewhat of a racial utopia whose population knew no color line. Still, black soldiers often found themselves commanded by southern white officers who were intent on carrying Jim Crow to Europe. Before black men left for European theaters of war, they faced humiliating conditions in stateside training camps. Black soldiers described camps near Newport News, Virginia as, quote, little hells set up to torment colored men who would be something if they were allowed to rise. Non-combatants often had no barracks, few tents, fewer outhouses, and nowhere to bathe. So wartime violence escalated into a riot in Houston, Texas in 1917, in which African-American soldiers of the 24th Infantry retaliated against the widespread abuses that black soldiers and black women had suffered at the hands of Houston's white police force. When it was all over, 13 black soldiers were hanged. It was clear to black soldiers that they had returned from one war only to fight another. But much to the horror of white Southerners, African-American soldiers proved more than willing to fight for democracy at home. So now I want to take a look at an editorial that was written by Du Bois after the war, and it's called Returning Soldiers. It was written in 1919. I think we're going to see some contrasts in what Du Bois wrote in 1915 before the war compared to this, this editorial. So can I have three volunteers who would be willing to read for, for us? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, great. So you guys will each read a page and I'll just I'll just I'll change the slide and then follow. Okay? Yeah, that's great, thanks. <laughs> we are returning from war. Tens of thousands of black men were drafted into a great struggle. For, for beating France and against the threat of German race, arrogance, we fought gladly to the last drop of blood. For America and her highest ideals, we fought and far of hope. For the dominant Southern oligarchy, entrenched in Washington, we fought a bitter recognition. For the America that represents and grows attention, dis disfranchisement, caste, brutality, and devilish insult. For this, we were forced by vindictive fate to fight also. But today we return. We return from the slavery of uniform, which the world's madness demanded us to dawn, to the freedom of civil power. We stand again to look America squarely in the face and call a spade a spade. We sing this country of ours, despite all its better souls, have done and dreamed is yet a shameful one. Disenfranchised and become citizens. 
described Biden as a deliberate theft and robbery of the only protection of poor against rich and black against white. Land that disenfranchises citizens and all this wealth and democracy rely on the middle class. It encourages ignorance. It has never really tried to educate the, near, the Negro. A dominant minority does not want Negro to educate. We want servants, dogs, whores, and monkeys. It steals from us. It organizes industry to cheat us. It cheats us out of our land. It cheats us out of our labor. It complicates our savings. It reduces our wages. It raises our rent. It steals our profit. It taxes us without representation. It keeps us consistently universally poor, and then it feeds us on charity and derives our poverty. Okay. Last slide. It insults us. It has organized nationwide and worldwide propaganda, deliberate <coughs> and continuous insult and defamation of black blood wherever found. It decrees that it shall not be possible in job and residence. Or if no play, education or instruction for a black man exists without tacit or open acknowledgement of his inferiority to the dirty to white dog. And it looks upon any attempt to question or even discuss this dogma as arrogance, unwarranted assumption and treason. This is the country to which we sold the democracy return. This is the fatherland to which we fought, but it is our fatherland. It is right for us to fight. The faults of our country are our faults. Under similar circumstances, we would fight again. But by the God of heaven, we are cowards and jackasses. Now that the war is over, we do not, we do not marshal every ounce of our brain and rock bronze to fight a sterner, longer, more unbending battle against the forces of hell in our own land. We return. We return to fight. We return to fight. Great. Thank you. So how do we put together these two editorials? The first one from 1915 where Du Bois is saying, you know, we have to close ranks, we have to fight shoulder to shoulder, this is what we have to do as Americans, and then this very critical editorial. Yes? I think in this one's kind of realizing that perhaps that they're still not being it as Americans, like they're still not being as Americans as we both on this war because they don't come home to the same walk of the other so we get right. Right, exactly, exactly. Yes. Before in the first piece, <clears throat> it seemed like um, he was promoting the ideals of, um, the, uh, of American equality. And then in the second piece, uh, the author was pushing for, but will force them to see what they've been pushing out all this time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Other thoughts or other responses to this editorial? Yes. Um, in the first one, he was kind of telling everyone to like put aside all of the issues for right now and focus on finishing the war. And then in this one, he was bringing white all of the and like, like it's been too long, we have to kind of sit down and over and over and we have to make Exactly. Right. Yes. Yes. It seems though that his goal is the same. So much unity. It's just that now we want to justify our people. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. So he wants black Americans to be included in American democracy. And at first he thought that the war was an avenue through which that inclusion could happen. But then after the war, after the disappointment, after the race riots, after the humiliating treatment that black soldiers received, he starts to realize, you know, we that's not that 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 wasn't that that didn't work as as a way for African Americans to achieve citizenship. So now it's important to be more militant to really sort of push for for rights, and that's exactly the kind of motivation that that led many to move from the south to the north. So all of these reasons, the, this omnipresent threat of racial violence, the heightened expectations of World War One, the diminished flow of European immigrants, the opening of industrial jobs in the north, and also this kind of change, this sort of growing sense of militancy. Um, all of these are, are some of the reasons for the migration. So for these reasons, beginning in 1915 and slowing not until around 1970, migrants would cross into alien lands. They would learn new ways of speaking and new ways of carrying themselves. Places like New York, Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, and Philadelphia were frightening and already crowded, just as smaller and equally foreign cities like Milwaukee, Oakland, Newark, and Gary were. And this map shows us 
that migrants would often travel along routes that led them directly north from their southern home. So this, so this was very common. So my family, also from Louisiana, uh, went right from New Orleans and, and, and to Chicago. So this was one very common route also from Mississippi to Chicago. So many of you who are from Chicago, for example, might have relatives who originally were from either Mississippi or Alabama. Many migrants who were further on sort of the eastern seaboard went from Florida or Georgia or South Carolina to New York or Philadelphia. And then often migrants who left from Texas settled in Los Angeles and then later in Oakland. Um, but it is very striking to see the ways that the migration, for the most part, was a movement directly north from one southern home. So here is a picture of a colored waiting room in the Union Station Terminal in Jacksonville, Florida in 1921, which you can see is really filled with migrants heading north. So the migration would not end until, 19, until the 1970s when the South began to finally change, when the whites only signs came down, the all white schools opened up, and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 guaranteed the right to vote. By then, nearly half of all black Americans, some 47%, would be living outside the South, compared to 10% when the migration began. And if we take a look at some population statistics, we can see here the kind of dramatic growth that's happening just in the 20 year period between 1910 and 1930. Um, in Chicago in particular, the black population skyrocketed from 44,000 at the start of the migration to more than 1 million by the end of it. And in fact, by the turn of the 21st century, blacks made up a third of Chicago's residents. More blacks now live in the city of Chicago than the entire state of Mississippi. So the migration also coincides with a period of increased Caribbean immigration as well. Between 1900 and 1913, 40,000 immigrants from the British West Indies relocated mostly to Harlem. These migrants also underwent similar experiences in accommodating themselves to life in the US. But Caribbean immigrants were largely not peasants from rural districts. Only about 14% who arrived between 1901 and 1935 were classified as agricultural workers. A majority had spent some time in small towns or cities before immigrating to the US. Many of these men and women were part of a visibly educated elite known as the Caribbean Talented Tenth. Um, and were often middle class and were either educated or skilled in the trade. So now that we've gotten a sense of the push pull factors and some of the, the population changes, let's consider how these men and women made the decision to change or to leave. In many ways, migrants did what people have done for centuries when life becomes untenable. They did what the pilgrims did under the tyranny of British rule what European Jews did under the spread of Nazism, and what the Irish did during the potato famine. What binds these stories together and makes them universal was the hopeful search for something better. To leave, the migrants had to draw on their inner reserves, and they had to depend on networks of knowledge about the North. So black railroad workers employed by the Illinois Central and other railroads brought stories, handbills, and newspapers such as the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier to Southern readers. Pullman porters were known as the Grapevine Telegraph, and they distributed newspapers as well as rumors about the North and employment opportunities and created circuits of information. Robert Abbott, the militant editor of the Chicago Defender, seeing the possibility of racial advancement and a larger readership for his journal, used the biblical imagery of, a, of an Egyptian-style exodus and a promised land to promote the advantages of black life in the North. Now, to get a better sense of why the migrants left, let's take a look at some of the letters that the migrants wrote. 
These letters were forwarded by the Chicago Defender. Here's one example of um, the Defender sort of tracking the migration, publishing information about the migrants leaving. Can I ask for some volunteers who would be willing to read some of the migrants' letters? Um, maybe can I have five volunteers? Okay, one, two, three, four, great, one more. Five, great. Okay, so maybe each person could read a paragraph and then we'll switch. <coughs> Dear Sir, I saw your advice in the Chicago Defender. I thought to write for, far, for farther information. I'd be glad to now. Okay, I'm sorry. To know how I can get there. I'm a labor man. Want to get where work is plentiful and good wages. I want to get in a Christian nice place and have good family and care for them. I want to come up there, see the place, and then later on send for family. Can you send for me or describe me to someone who will send for me? Thank you. Great, thank you. Who was our second reader? Yes. Um, dear sir, I would like for you to write to me and tell me how is time up how time is up there and jobs is to get. I would like for you to get me a job and my wife. She is a number one good good cook, maid nurse job. I am a firing boiler steam fitter and experienced mechanic help and will do laboring work if you cannot get me one of those jobs above that I can do. I have work in a foundry as a molder helper and has lots of experience at that. I am 27 years of age. If you can get me a job, I would like for you to do so, please, and let me know and will pay for the truck for trouble. If you know of any firms that need a man, give them my address, please. I won't. I want to get out of the South where I can demand something for my work. Great. Thank you. <coughs> so from these letters, we can see that these were very carefully executed plans. Migrants created meticulous links and reached out to chains of men, to neighbors and friends that could guide them and support them. And they also sought help from public agencies, social welfare organizations, newspaper editors, and employers in an effort to glean information from a wide variety of sources. So now we're going to read some letters um, from people who have moved to Chicago and get a sense of how they have adjusted to life in Chicago. Um, so we can sort of find out what was life like once the migrants arrived and what were their kind of initial encounters with the North like. Okay, so who was my first volunteer? Great, thanks. The wife thinks that Northern Negroes have better manners, but are not as friendly as the colored people in the South. She says people do not visit each other and one is never invited to die in a friend's house. She thinks they cannot afford it with food so high. She thinks people were better in the South than they are here and says that had to be good there for they had nothing else to do but go to church. Thank you, great. And who was my second? It's, it's colder, it's, people aren't as warm, people aren't as friendly, there's not that sense of family and community that we had in the South. But what are some of the benefits that she's noting as well? Um, she sees this freedom, um, especially with the Jim Crow laws and her ability to go, and she likes that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And going back to to, a, to what we were talking about before about sharecropping, you know, she's also saying that you know here or or what, one of the slides before talked about a man who wanted to get the, the wages that he knew that he deserved for his labor. So there's also a sense of maybe a possibility of fairer treatment um, and being being rewarded for your labor the way you should rather than often being um, taken advantage of. Right. So let's let's look at one more kind of initial encounter with the North. And this is Richard Wright. So we can think back to some of his expectations. If you remember, he was one of the he wrote one of the poems that we read earlier. And now we're going to see sort of him describing his initial encounter in Chicago. So can I have volunteers to read this? Can I have four volunteers to read Richard Rice's Virginia? <coughs> and then would you like to, did you put your hand? I'll read it. Oh, okay, great, okay, good. so two, and then two more? Okay, and yes, okay, great, okay. My first 
Sons of the flat, black stretches of Chicago, depressed and dismayed, mocked all my fantasies. Chicago seemed an unreal city whose mythical houses were filled with slabs and black coal, wreathed in piles of gray smoke, houses whose foundations were sinking slowly into a dank prairie. Flashes of steam showed me intermittently on the wide horizon, leaving transistently in the wind. <laughs> what would happen to me here? Would I survive? My expectations were modest. I wanted only a job. Hunger had long been my daily companion. Diversion and re recreation, with the exception of reading, were unknown. In all my life, through surrounded by many people, I had not a single satisfying sustained relationship with another human being. And not having any, I did not miss it. The train rolled into the depot, and Maggie and I got off and walked slowly through the crowds into the station. I looked about to see if there were signs saying, for white and for colored, I saw none. Black people and white people moved about, each seemingly intent upon his private mission. There was no racial fear. It was strange to pause before a crowded newsstand and buy a newspaper without having to wait until a white man was served, and yet I began to grow tense again, although it was a different sort of tension than I had known before. The street cut me. Aunt Maggie motioned for me to get on and push me toward a seat in which a white man sat with me when we out the window. I sat down beside the man and looked straight at him. After a moment, I stole a glance at the white man out of the corners of my eyes, and he was still staring at me. His mind fastened upon some inward thought. I did not exist for him. I was as far from his mind as the stone building that swept past, that swept past in the street. It would have been illegal for me to sit beside him in the part of the South that I had come from. The white man who sat beside me rose, and I turned my knees aside to let him pass. And another white man sat beside me and buried his face in the newspaper. How could that possibly be? Was he conscious of my blindness? Thank you. So how do, how do you make sense of Richard Wright's experience? What, what, what kind of feeling does he give you about how he felt when he, uh, when he arrived in Chicago? What was, how would, yes? He seems like kind of at first uncomfortable, mm -hmm. uneasy, because it's so different for him because he's so used to like white people, I guess, being so conscious of, of his blindness having to go through all the um, discrimination. So what he's experiencing now is so different that it kind of makes him uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, now is he like, he feels really confused. Like maybe he had felt like he got used to how it was in South and felt the security of knowing that like, there would be that separation. Right. So uh, like of having somebody so close to you that you never interact with like, is just really strange for you. And this is a very common trope in many novels about migration. You'll often have this scene where a migrant is riding a bus or on a train, and either he or she brushes shoulders with a white person and sort of panics because that just wasn't allowed in the South. That kind of close contact was just never experienced by these migrants. And they're starting to sort of get a sense of the new kind of comportment that they're able to experience in, in the North. Yes, did you want to I was just saying that at, at some point it seemed as though there was a complete disbelief that this was actually happening. He was questioning himself to see like, okay, is it just me that is noticing my blackness or am I the only one? Is it everyone else noticing? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. <clears throat> and it, was, it wasn't quite sad, but almost um, he was kind of uh, maybe a little disappointed that he moved from one form of anonymity to another form of anonymity. Right. Yeah. yeah, what sense do we get of the North in, in this description, and particularly this line where he says, and yet, I began, whoops, and yet I began to grow tense again, although it was a different sort of tension than I had known before. What's the tension, what's the difference in the tension in the North and in the South? Is there anyone who hasn't commented who would like to, who would like to speak? Um, yeah, I guess. In the South, it was almost like black people like didn't even matter. Or, like, but in the North, it was like everybody was in their own world, so it wasn't even normal socialized with anybody, no matter what race. Yeah. 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 Other. Yes. I kind of felt like um, right in the South, it was in the of like you know, very strong negative about black people. In the North, it's not that. Well, people see them different from black people, but it's not that.
know the punch is coming, mm -hmm. so you try and prepare yourself for it. But at the north, you don't know where it's coming from or when it's coming, so you just kind of wait in there for it to come. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Those are really, really great ways of explaining how there's a different kind of tension. There's still a tension, but it's different. There's a different kind of code of behavior that these migrants are learning for the first time. And it's a very different kind of experience, and it's not all positive, but it's different. So they're trying to sort of reconcile and trying to kind of negotiate and understand what this new life will be for them in the North. So in, the in 1920, the Chicago Commission on Race Relations polled black migrants about what they liked about the North, and a resounding number, nearly all migrants, answered freedom. Of course, freedom meant different things to different people, just as it did 50 years earlier at, a t at the time of emancipation. But we can't underestimate the possibility of no longer having to tip one's hat to a white man, or scrambling to yield the sidewalk to a white woman, or no longer being derisively and disrespectfully called boy or girl by whites who were far younger in age. My grandmother, who migrated from New Orleans, Louisiana, to Chicago in 1945, remembered not being able to bring her children, including my mother, to any of the city parks in New Orleans without asking for trouble. She remembered not being able to try on hats in stores without being compelled to buy them. But perhaps my grandmother's most vivid memory was seeing a black man physically kicked off of a moving train. When I asked my grandmother why she and my grandfather decided to move to Chicago, that memory from almost 70 years ago, my grandmother just turned 100 in June, that was the, that was the first story that she related. Witnessing that appalling violence, the thoughtless and vicious way that the man had been kicked off the train, would stay with my grandparents and would set their plans to leave the South in motion. So we can't underestimate what it meant to have the right to vote. We can't underestimate what it meant, let's see, to be free from perpetual debt, to have no recourse or options from redress from a landlord's abuses. <laughs> The North offered entirely new racial protocols and promised to be a place where, as one Poland reporter put it, a man is a man. But did the North actually live up to its billing as a promised land? First of all, the rapid population growth in a number of cities resulted in the overcrowding of black residents in certain resources and worried reformers, black and white alike. The strain was especially obvious when it came to housing stock. And here's a picture of kind of famous housing um, formations in Chicago, known as kitchenettes. Landlords converted old houses into what were called kitchenettes. So they might take a seven-room apartment that would rent for $50 a month to whites and cut it up into seven small apartments of one room each, install a small gas stove and a small sink in each room, and rent each of these rooms for $42 a month. Entire families occupied single rooms, sharing with other residents an inadequate number of bathrooms and kitchens, exceeding the plumbing capacity, and leading to a serious deterioration in sanitary conditions. The housing shortage and mounting racial tensions in Chicago led to a race riot in 1919 when a black teenager's raft floated too close to an all-white beach on the south side. The teenager died after being struck by a rock. Between July 27th and 31st, black and white Chicagoans battled in the streets. By August 8th, 23 blacks and 15 whites were dead, and at least 530 Chicagoans had suffered injuries. The police were unable and unwilling to suppress the violence. Only a timely rainstorm and the belated assignment of the Illinois National Guard to Chicago city streets restored order. Although many newcomers were disappointed by the failure
failure of Chicago race relations to live up to their expectations, the 1919 riot highlighted some of the liberating aspects of the Great Migration, even as it demonstrated the ubiquity of racial conflict. Chicago's riot grew out of a competitive situation that suggested the importance of blacks in the city's political and economic life, as well as in the housing market. The riot also revealed a growing black militancy that would have provoked either repression or expulsion in the South. When whites attacked, blacks fought back, and the Chicago Defender kept score right on the front page. The need for social welfare and urban development programs led to the creation of the National Urban League, founded in New York in 1911, as one of the most important new social service agencies formed especially to address the urban conditions for blacks. By 1919, the National Urban League had branches in 30 cities. And here's a picture of the Chicago National Urban League. Um, and it became the leading social agency in the black community by providing employment, housing, social work, and relief to migrants. The Wabash YMCA also helped newcomers to find jobs and homes and served as a center for activities and recreation. The Urban League also legislated morality through door-to-door -door visits and leaflets like this one. And this is what I passed out to you guys that you have a copy of. So this is um, one leaflet that the, that the National Urban League passed out. And if you take a look, you can see some of their, their helpful hints. Uh, one so it's called helpful hints. And one is don't carry on loud conversations or use vulgar or obscene language on streetcars, streets, or in public places. Remember that this hurts us as a race. Another one is don't fail to meet the teachers of your children. Keep in touch with them. Every hateful thing that your child says about the teacher is not true. Another one, don't make lots of unnecessary noise going to and from baseball games. If the parks are taken away from you, it will be partly your own fault. Also, don't do your children's hair up in the alleys, canals, and knots. If you don't want other children to make fun of them, keep them clean. Uh, don't fail to start a savings account with some good bank or building loan association. And two that I often struggle with are don't stay away from work every time someone gives a picnic or a boat ride. Stay on your job, others do. And don't think that you can hold your job unless you are on time, industrious, efficient, and sober. So what do you make of these helpful hints? How helpful are these? <coughs> what do you think about this advice that the National Urban League was giving out? Practical?
condescended, but I think like, I, I'm getting the feeling that they're doing it, I guess, like in good faith. I know sometimes, like for example, my mom is like Matthew, you know, always remember to brush your hair. And I, it's kind of obvious, like, yeah, you're supposed to brush your hair. It's like a little bit condescending, but I know that my mom's just like looking out for me, right? right. Especially because sometimes my hair is like super nappy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think maybe like it's condescending from our point of view, but maybe the people who are putting this out were just like, they didn't want to make any assumptions about what the people were using, they didn't know. Right, yeah, yes. I think it's also a lot to do with the time frame that these were given out. I mean, like, today, it'd be weird if someone walked up to you and told you, hey, dress this way, not that way, and don't curse in public. Like, these days, it'd be strange, no matter what race you are, for someone to tell you that. But I mean, back in the day, and I mean, the background that these people were coming from, where they didn't have someone to teach them this on a daily basis, and they weren't coming from society where you get up in a suit and tie and you go to work at 8 in the morning and get off at 9 and then in the afternoon or get off at 5 in the afternoon. I mean, they didn't have that kind of society, so that's why I think it kind of seems condescending to us today, but back then it was a different culture per se, and so I don't think it really seemed condescending to them at the time. Yeah. But be clear, they're not getting up in a suit and tie going to work, right? Is that the case, Alex? I just want to make sure that these are laborers, right? Right. Who have taken on another form of labor. They have gone from picking cotton to maybe 15 hours a day, maybe going to 10 to 8 hours a day in these fields. So I don't want everyone to get an impression like they're literally sitting shoulder to shoulder with white people going in suit, you know, doing all this. It is industrial and it is labor that is happening, correct? Exactly, exactly. I mean, maybe, you know, you had some black elites like so, Robert Abbott. The new one Exactly. Exactly, but right for the most part, these these are instructions that are being sent out to the working class. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Can you let your hand up. Oh, oh yeah. I was thinking. Um, what I found most disturbing is just that since every day, every day is adult, rather than having to do this kind of things, to feel like yeah. there's no way that black people are able to sort of increase the the gains themselves by like going into the industry and sort of becoming worse. Yeah. So, so going off of that comment, do you get a sense, are there, even within the don'ts, even within all of that negative language, are there any of these helpful hints that you, that you still get sort of a peek at the, uh, 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 the, the freedoms or the, the kind of presented to African Americans? Yeah, it seems that a lot of things are asking people to really start taking on this respectability because in a lot of these situations, you know, some of them about don't spend all your money pleasure, make sure you start a savings account. It's, it's really speaking to the fact that these are luxuries you did not have before. Right. So now in this new sense, you know, even though it is coming from this condescending standpoint, it, does, it really is trying to like help people, you know, basically show the back heads up how to be respectable in this new place that you're in. Right, exactly. So you hear there's, there's a mention about about um, starting a savings account, there's a mention about going to a good doctor, there's there's uh, a, a note talking about to going to, talking to your teachers, to your children's teachers, exactly, going to baseball games. So you're getting a sense, even though many, many of these hints are, they seem somewhat condescending, but then at the same time, you're also getting a sense of some of the possibilities in Northern life that maybe <coughs> would have been very new to many of these migrants. What do you guys think of these pictures? Why, why do you think that the, the National Urban League chose to use these two images? Yes. And these just pictures kind of reaffirm the fact that they're trying to help everyone make a good impression on the people that they've kind of bombarded with the suit and stuff like black people. So they're like making sure the northerners aren't going to look down on them. Yeah. It seems like 
like a lot of the hints are sort of geared towards presenting a more docile sort of way of dealing with other people. So I thought that maybe they chose a woman to um, emphasize the fact that one seems more approachable because she's not quite as, I mean, the other ones were not aggressive, but a little bit more like masculine the way she's sitting. And so I thought that was really good. Right, yeah. Yeah. Did, did you hear your hand up? Yeah. Um, I think the body is really important in it because it's like showing, I think it's almost meant to show what white people see when they look at mm -hmm. black people and how they can change the perception to see more of the second picture. Right. Yeah. 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 And we can also kind of imagine that, you know, here she's got a broom in the background, so we're thinking that, you know, she probably was, you know, doing some sort of household work, whereas here, this woman is holding a newspaper in her hand, so it's, it's indicating that she's literate and that she's educated. Um, we also might imagine that, you know, one of the, the benefits of moving to the North for black women particularly was that they were able to have more control over their bodies, right? So that here we see a woman who's sitting, her legs are kind of, you know, open, whereas this woman is sitting more with her legs together, and, uh, you know, I think we sort of get a sense of the possibility of being able to have more control over one's body, perhaps not being preyed upon by white men to the same extent as, as women were in the South, um, and just having more power and more control and more agency over one's, one's life. Um, that, that might be part of why they chose a woman to kind of indicate those, those the kinds of sexual abuses that were very common in the <coughs> South. Um, that was another form of freedom in, in, in the North. Yes. I just figured that the woman would have a better influence on the children or guys to the parents and that sort of thing. So this way they could perpetuate the new um, advice they were giving. But if they just gave it to men, maybe they would discard it, disregard it, and maybe be um, less open to it. Yeah, no, that's a great point that women were, were much more involved in the raising of children. Yes. Yes. Oh, um, I think I think it also sort of ties into how, um, I mean, especially during that time, women were supposed to sort of be, or at least women and children were supposed to be seen but not heard. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, I think that I, I mean I personally think that it's very patronizing. And so I think it ties into um, that that idea that was very common back then. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll just sort of is it is it about time we start to wrap up? Okay. So, so I just want to wrap up by talking a little bit, just sort of concluding by talking a little bit about whether the North did meet the expectations of migrants. And what I'd like to do is show you some slides. Can, I, can everybody see if I stand here? Okay. I, and now I'm like so close to the camera too. Um, so, so, oh, oh, okay, great. That'd be awesome. Okay. So, so I want to just show you very briefly a, a, a series called the Migration Series, which by Jacob Lawrence, who is one of the most famous African American painters. And he was only in his 20s when he produced the Migration series, which made him nationally famous. So maybe we'll just we'll just sort of go through them pretty quickly. I just want, want you to get a sense of some of the, the, the panels that he created. If you, if you sort of juxtapose both the text with the art and what kind of sense of the North that this offers to you. Can you guys read them? So, so here, in the North, the Negro had better educational facilities. Okay. And, then, and the migrants kept coming. Okay. So maybe we'll just go through those one more time really quickly. Yeah. So the church was very important to migrants. What kind of sense, and here's, here's a great image of the class conflict. The Negroes who had been north for quite some time met their fellow men with disgust and aloofness. Mm -hmm. So that kind of gets back to that point that we were talking about with the helpful hints, that many of these African Americans who had been in the north were very anxious when they saw the migrants coming because their position in the north was already quite tenuous. Um, and then they were worried about, well, how are we going to accept all of these new migrants who are coming?
about the North are you getting from these these paintings? Yes. Um, I just noticed that like none of the black and black faces. I think it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, see, right. They don't uh, have faces. I thought that was awesome. Why do you think Jacob Lawrence did not paint faces on either the white or the the? Well, it looks like the white people have yeah, a little bit more definition. definition. Yes. Um, maybe like in the North they weren't able to express themselves as they had in the South. So it's like they, they believe that expression that you have on your face, which is like the easiest way to express how you feel. Like, like, yeah, your emotion. Okay. Yeah. So he's just showing that like a very rich Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think he's trying to portray the North and the before the city and kind of the bad people. I think that overall they cared about the other group, but individually. Visually, they didn't follow, see that each one had a good housing condition and equal opportunities. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, yes. I think it also comes back to the fact that he wants black people to see themselves in these pictures and that if there's not a specific face there, and you can see the face in that Exactly. So, trying to get a sense of the community um, and creating sort of a commonality or universality um, mm -hmm. might be part of why he decided to draw black, black, uh, black people in this way, yeah. Okay, so just to quickly wrap up, I just want to finish actually on that note about community. Um, thank you, that's perfect. So, so the migrants uh, did create a very strong, very strong community in each of the cities that they, that they moved to. Um, and there were several different kinds of institutions that the migrants uh, created and that thrived. Um, one, of course, was African-American denomination. Um, especially migrants from the rural South were accustomed to services that accompanied, uh, that were accompanied by improvisational singing or shouting and other forms of active participation. Um, and worship was one way that migrants could adjust to the urban North while retaining aspects of one, uh, one, one Southern cultural heritage. The old settlers, on the other hand, preferred more refined and quieter services. So here's another way where we see this kind of conflict between the, the, the migrants who had been in Chicago or the residents of northern cities who had been there longer, kind of a conflict between them and the newer migrants who had different forms of worship. Um, Okay, so in Chicago, migrants attended the annual Bud Milliken Parade and cheered at the predominantly black Wendell Phillips High School football games. And migrants, um, and migrants also enjoyed going to movies and taking part in the city's active and lively nightlife. Embracing the emerging mass consumer culture, migrants bought radios, attended baseball games, crowded cabarets, and patronized chain stores. And here's another example of blacks operating their own grocery stores and also their own funeral homes. Thank you. And then one more. In Chicago, the first black owned and operated hospital in America was established at a time when few public or private medical facilities were open to blacks. So the influence of the South on the streets of Chicago's South Side was unmistakable. The aromas of Southern cooking, the sounds of New Orleans jazz and the Mississippi blues, styles of worship, patterns of speech, these were just a handful of the ways that black Southerners reshaped their new environments. In 1910, 78% of black Chicagoans lived on the south side in a narrow strip of land known as the Black Belt, beginning at the edge of an industrial warehouse district and stretching along, stretching southward for more than 30 blocks. And here we get this real sense of a vibrant human community and space with an array of institutions, including many of the ones that I showed you in terms of the grocery stores and the churches and of the, um, the Provident Hospital. Um, so, so we see the strong sense of community um, that arose in, in, in cities like Chicago. Um, and in some ways, these cities or these black neighborhoods became almost like a city within a city. They were, they were entirely functioning in and of themselves. So with all that grew out of this mass movement, did the Great Migration achieve the aim of those who participated in it? Were the people who left the South 
better off for having done so? Was the loss of what they left behind worth what they confronted in the anonymous cities that they fled to? Throughout the migration, social scientists all but concluded that the answer to those questions was no, that the migration had led to the troubles of the urban North and West. Most scholars blame the dysfunction of inner cities on the migrants themselves. The migrants were cast as poor illiterates who brought out of place <coughs> on birth, joblessness, and welfare dependency wherever they went. But newly available census records suggest the opposite to be true. Migrants, it turns out, were better educated than those they left behind in the South. And on the whole, they were nearly as well educated as those who they encountered in the North. Compared to the Northern blacks already there, the migrants were more likely to be married and remain married, more likely to raise their children in a two-parent household, more likely to be employed. The migrants as a group managed to earn a higher income than northern-born blacks, even though they were relegated to the lowest paying positions. They were less likely to be on welfare than the blacks they encountered in the north, partly because they had come so far, had experienced such hard times, and they were willing to work longer hours or second jobs in positions that few <coughs> northern blacks wanted. In the early decades of the migration, it would have been difficult to imagine that the migrants would end up leading the very cities that had rejected them upon arrival. For example, the first black mayors in each of the major receiving cities of the North and West were sons of parents who had migrated from the South. Many black parents who left the South got the one thing they wanted just by leaving their children would have a chance to grow up free of Jim Crow and to be their fuller selves. It cannot be known what the course of the lives of people like Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, Aretha Franklin, Michelle Obama, Bill Cosby, Condoleezza Rice, Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jackson, Queen Latifah, Sean Puffy Combs, and countless others might have been if their parents or grandparents had not participated in the Great Migration and raised them in the North or West. And of course, millions of other children of the Migration grew up to lead productive, though anonymous lives in quiet, everyday ways that few people will ever hear about. In the end, it could be said that the common denominator for leaving was the desire to be free free to try out any job they please, play checkers with whomever they chose, sit where they wished on the streetcar, watch their children walk across the stage for the degree most of them did not have the chance to get. And I'm going to end here with this image of my father and my Aunt Shirley sitting on their steps um, of Chicago. So sitting on these steps at the age of four, my father, a migrant himself, who had just arrived from Augusta, Georgia, probably wouldn't have imagined that years later he would be able to go to the University of Illinois without great discrimination or fear. He would enter the military and become a captain. He would become a professional engineer with NASA. And later, he would spend most of his career working for IBM, the top technology company of the time. His parents' decision to move to Chicago enabled him to live a much more comfortable life. If he had stayed in the South, he would have gone to segregated schools. In the 1950s, he would not have been able to attend the University of Georgia without trauma. He would have survived, but he may not have flourished in the ways that he did. And as a grandchild of the migration, I might not have had the wonderful opportunity that I have today to speak to brilliant students like you. So if you ask my father about the migration, he will tell you it was a resounding success. If you ask him whether the migration achieved the goals of the migrants, the answer is yes. Thank you so much for